All um, right, you're good to go. Okay, good afternoon. I am going to call the Finance Committee meeting to order. This is actually a joint meeting of two committees at this point. So when I'm uh, finished uh, calling the Finance Committee to order and uh, doing the formalities with that, I will uh, ask Mandy then to take over to um, call the Community Resources Committee to order. This is uh, meetings of Tuesday, January 5th, 2021 at 2 p.m. And um, this meeting um, is being held as a virtual meeting pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law chapter 30, a section 18, this, uh, meeting of the finance committee and of the community resources committee is being conducted via remote participation. And because it's being conducted by remote participation, I'm gonna do a quick roll call of the people who are present from the finance committee, just to make sure that every, uh, they can hear and um, that when they reply, that we know that they, um, we can hear them. Um, so Lynn Griesmer. Present. And uh, Bernie Kubiak. Present. Bob Hegner. Present. Dorothy Pam. Present. Um, Pat Angelus. Present. And that's, I think that that is, um, constitutes a quorum. Um, the, there are two members who are not present at the time, present time. Uh, there was a conflict with the uh, meeting involving the uh, Massachusetts School Building Authority. Um, and Kathy Shane is the chair of that committee. So she will not be able to join us at the beginning, but will join the finance committee meeting when uh, they have concluded their meeting with MSBA and our uh, newest uh, re uh, member, uh, non-voting member, Jane Scheffler, uh, has, uh, uh, is not able to join us today, um, but uh, said that she will be um, fully engaged with the committee as of the next meeting, and she's looking forward to participation. Mandy, you want to call your committee to order? Sure. Um, I was just going to text. Sarah has joined us too, and she's not late because I haven't called the meeting to order yet. So, <laughs> um, ditto to everything that Andy said about um, the virtual meeting um, and seeing a quorum of the Community Resources Committee present. I'm calling it to order this special meeting of the Community Resources Committee to order at 2.04 p.m. I'm just going to run through our committee members' names. Um, to make sure they can be heard and we can hear them. Um, we're going to start with Sarah Swartz. Present. Evan Ross. Present. Steve Schreiber. Here. Mandy Johanneke is here and Shalini Baumilne is not here yet, but will be joining us shortly. So we'll catch her when she does get joined in. Okay. So the reason for the joint meeting is that um, we have a request that was referred to both committees um, that requires us to um, act before the uh, next meeting of the uh, council. And um, it is a request uh, for approval of the expenditure of a uh, amount from the community resource, uh, excuse me, from the Community Preservation Act Committee for Housing Acquisition. And um, also present with us today is uh, Dave Zomack, um, who's the assistant town manager, uh, John Hornick from the Housing Trust, Sarah Arschel from the uh, Community Preservation Act Committee, and Bob Mora, um, and uh, of course, uh, staff support for our the Finance Committee, Sean Mangano, is also present. So with that, I'm going to ask Dave to- um, And Sonia Aldridge. Oh, Sonia, you're joined too, thank you. Uh, so uh, Dave. 
Oh, great, Andy. I, I think with your permission, um, what I was hoping to do today um, with Rob and, and with John, and I know Sarah is here to speak to the CPAC's uh, recommendation on this, on this acquisition, uh, because not all members of the Finance Committee um, have heard the full presentation, we were hoping to quickly go through um, the slide deck that was shown to the council. Would that work for, the, for you, Andy, and for the Finance Committee? Um, that's uh, fine with me. I did okay. ask that we did send the slide deck to the resident members and ask them to review the slide deck in advance so that if they had questions that they could be prepared to um, get to their questions fairly quickly. Well, so know, we, could, we could really quickly go through. We're not going to read the slides or anything like that, but I think okay. it would give it a little quick context and then we can refer back to maps as questions come up. So I don't know whether Sean or Athena is controlling the... Uh, Linda's. Or uh, Lynn, Lynn who's ever Linda's. controlling. So great thank you and and i will be brief i think um there's a couple of slides that i'll handle then i'll turn it over to john and rob has one or two as well so we're excited to um uh, speak to the finance committee and crc about this this potential project on Belchertown road um suffice it to say that this is um this is a, a somewhat new approach uh, for the town of amherst the town is taking the lead on this on this acquisition we have uh uh, engaged uh, and and secured a purchase and sale agreement with the owner of these three par parcels off of uh, Belchertown Road um, with a potential closing date of February uh, 16th. Um, uh, this is not unlike uh, uh, being a, a more aggressive and more proactive at acquiring land for affordable housing is not unlike what other uh, communities do throughout Massachusetts and in particular our, our neighbors to the to the west Northampton uh, does this creatively and and quite consistent, quite consistently uh, over the past 10, 15 years. Next slide. Um, what we hope to do is, is purchase this land and, and open up the opportunity, the possibility of uh, building 40 new affordable units on the property. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the property attributes in a minute. Uh, we've already done most of the uh, uh, development uh, viability work. We've assessed the property. Uh, we've done appraisals, we've done wetlands work, uh, survey work is, is pending, but we don't need that uh, right now to move forward. Um, and the hope is to possibly um, um, work together with the um, uh, Housing Trust to create a, a combined RFP for this property and the um, uh, property known as the Street School property. Next slide. Why this property? Just to set the stage, this is in the East Village. Uh, as you can see in the slide in the upper uh, upper center is um, Fort River School and the three parcels are outlined in red. Uh, there's a flag lot and two frontage lots. Um, uh, why this property? As staff and I uh, looked at this property that came on the market uh, some months ago, we really uh, uh, began to look closely at its it's proximity to the village center, proximity to Fort River School, to shops, it's walkability, it's on bus routes, uh, it's near conservation land, and it also happens to be near, very near East Street School, which is in the upper left-hand corner. So all of these characteristics, all of these attributes uh, really caught our eye, and we started to put together kind of a profile of the project and the property and say, this would be a good property for the trust and the town to work collaboratively on to purchase and develop into affordable housing. Next slide, please. So this is just kind of a, a Google, Google Street View showing the property in the, in the upper left, upper center, uh, flat, dry. Um, uh, it does have two structures on it. Um, the house on the left, uh, much older, I believe 1950s, that is currently rented. The structure on the right, the house on the right is 1990s, a modular uh, construction, and is currently vacant. Both properties have been uh, rented in the past by the owner. One owner owns all three parcels. Um, and of course, uh, uh, later on, we might talk about some of the potential possibilities of, of renting one or more of these structures for income 
uh, until we are able to build new affordable housing on the site. Next slide. Um, as we assess the property, as we looked at uh, analyzing the property, um, what we saw was 2.66 acres total, which is uh, a significant piece of property in Amherst. Uh, there are three properties, as I said, um, and uh, close to two acres are, are flat and dry. We've already assessed uh, and, and taken a look at any of the wetlands on the site. And we are very confident that the, uh, the properties combined have plenty of uh, uh, buildable area for a sizable affordable uh, housing um, complex. Uh, as, it, as it states there in the slide, 280 feet of frontage on Route 9 is significant. Um, we've executed a, a purchase and sale agreement, as I said, um, and our final contingency in that purchase and sale agreement is to uh, hopefully get approval by the town council. Uh, next slide. Um, I think I'll turn this over to John. Uh, yeah, I just want to add one thing to what Dave said about the property, which I is repeating of something I said last night. Um, Laura Baker of Valley Community Development, when looking for the property that eventually uh, was identified at 132 Northampton Road that Valley Community Development is working on, took two years to find that property. Also, they decided to purchase the property um, shortly after uh, identifying it, which is not something they usually do. And the reason for both is that it's very hard to find property in Amherst. And so I, I personally really appreciate the town finding this 2.6 acres plus on Belchertown Road, because it's not easy to do based on Laura's experience of hunting for two years. Um, we do need this. Uh, again, this slide basically talks about uh, various uh, reports or studies that were done to look at the need for housing. Um, when we committed to the housing production plan as a town over five years ago, we said we'd build 45 new affordable units a year um, less than 50 units have been added in the last five plus years. Uh, so we haven't really kept up with what we promised. Uh, the uh, rental costs of new places are extraordinarily high. Uh, the number, the occupancy rate is really high. So it's very tough to find affordable housing in Amherst. Uh, I think that's, I'll, I'll conclude there. People can look at the slide if there are additional questions they have, um, particularly about the table, which comes from the housing production plan. The next slide, please. Dave, are you or Rob taking this one? Dave, you're muted, sir. John, I think you were going to take this slide and rob the, the, the final slide. OK. Uh, this basically, again, goes a little bit further in adding information to the slide Dave had earlier about uh, the context. Um, this shows the couple of views from the property, one towards the East Village Center, um, as we pointed out earlier, it's probably a quarter to a half a mile from the center of East Amherst. So in one direction, you can see the buildings that are there. In the other direction, you can see the conservation land that is immediately uh, to the north of the property. So um, the property will help with the critical need it's connected to this farm conservation area. Um, actually, this says that the requested funding level, the town investment is less than $30,000 per unit. I think it's probably going to be closer to 20,000, if not less, per unit, which is quite good for Amherst. Um, as Dave mentioned earlier, for a number of reasons, we think it makes sense to bundle this property with the East Street property um, for development. And last but not least, 
the purchase price of $735,000 was I think about $30,000 below the appraised value. So overall, we did pretty well on this purchase. Next slide. Okay, uh, Rob Mora here. Uh, this slide was intended to provide a uh, potential development concept, uh, not at all what anyone would expect uh, to actually be uh, built here. Uh, once designers and developers have a chance to look at it, they'll certainly have their own ideas, but it, it's intended to demonstrate that there's uh, a great property here uh, with, with a lot of potential uh, for the type of and size development that would uh, make this attractive. Uh, this, this concept shows a footprint of a building outlined in red. It's approximately 13,000 square feet. Uh, we are looking at this at this point as potentially a three-story building uh, that could house uh, up to 40 units. Uh, to the rear of the property uh, shows a parking area uh, and then a little extra parking as the entrance driveway comes in. Uh, the three properties, uh, approximately 2.66 acres, uh, includes a delineated wetland area. Uh, this is now, the, where this work has been completed uh, in the uh, northeast corner mainly uh, of the property and uh, it, it measures approximately half an acre. So there's, you know, there's a good two acres of good developable property here. Uh, the house at the rear of uh, the prop most uh, northern part of the property, number 72, is a mid-90s modular building that we think has potential to be repurposed, uh, relocated, uh, and reused uh, for housing. Uh, so we're, we would like to have that option looked at in the future. Uh, up in the front corner, uh, the existing building uh, is, is an older structure, about 1,000 square feet. Uh, is, is located so far into the corner of the property that we also think that there's a potential to use that uh, because it's not really in a location that would be built on in any, uh, any proposed development. Now the property is located in the, in the neighborhood residential district, which means uh, this apartment building idea isn't permitted by our zoning bylaw. So the permitting path would be through the comprehensive permit uh, 40B process with the zoning board of appeals. Um, we uh, have completed the uh, initial wetlands delineation as mentioned. Uh, we have a contract uh, with a professional land surveyor that is uh, active and uh, we expect that work to be completed over the next four to six weeks. Uh, and we'll be providing uh, the next step with a baseline survey of the property uh, in the existing conditions. Uh, the, the building up front is rented. We are taking over, if we purchase this property in February, we're taking over a lease uh, with tenants that will continue. Uh, the, the, the monthly rent on the property currently is $1,950 and we would take over management uh, moving forward. Uh, next slide. And, and I think that's over to John. Uh, yeah, this is a review of both our costs and anticipated expenses uh, related to this uh, item. Uh, basically, the sources of money are a combination of the funding we're requesting or CPA has recommended that's before you now, which is the $600,000 to be bonded, plus an additional $225,000 which comes from existing CPA funds that have been deposited in the housing trust in a, pa a past year or years. So that's the total, that gives you the total. Um, and that's to go against the purchase price uh, plus a variety of other <coughs> uh, uh, expenses that we anticipate. Um, there are technical services, which uh, Rob and Dave have described, um, which we've already paid for um, or will pay for in the near future since they've been completed, like the appraisal, like the wetlands analysis, et cetera. Um, there are various legal fees that we pay uh, through K to KP law and fees to the property management company um, or assuming we use the same or possibly a different property management company 
since I doubt the town is actually going to take over the management of the property, assuming it is continued to be rented, as Dave suggested earlier. Finally, there's a contingency of $50,000 for things that we cannot anticipate, or um, if we need to uh, end the leases and move people out of that house that's rented, um, uh, we may be uh, liable to pay for their expenses in finding a new place to live. So that's the major reason for the contingency. Uh, so that basically gives you a summary of what we have available in funds and what we believe we will have to pay out when we acquire this property and immediately thereafter. Next slide. And I think, am I unmuted now? I, I think this yes. just this gives the uh, both committees uh, just an overview of our timeline. Our goal is to bring this project back to the full council on January 25th for a vote uh, up or down on the CPAC funding. Um, uh, and, and with our goal of, of, of course, closing uh, if that vote is favorable on, on February 16th. So I think we'll stop there. Um, I don't know, Andy, if you, uh, Sarah is here, I know representing as chair of the CPAC and um, I would turn it over to Sarah and then we're available, of course, for questions. Sarah, did you have anything you wanted to add to? Uh, well, I, uh, thanks, Andy. I think uh, all of you except the uh, non-voting members heard my statement last night. Um, which was really only to express our support uh, for the obviously for the for this project and hope hope council will vote for it. Um, I do though, uh, having just heard from John or and or Rob, have some questions about the the budget that was outlined there. Um, it's my understanding that all the funds uh, are essentially CPA funds in origin so that all the expenses shown would need to be eligible. And I don't know, Sonia or Sean maybe will know if the uh, costs associated with getting out of a lease or, or relocating tenants would be expenses that, uh, for which CPA funds could be used. And if, you know, if not, obviously, then they have to come from another source. Anyone have any questions for us <laughs> for CPA? You can uh, weigh in on weigh in on that one, Andy. Okay. Um, when you're ready for questions. Okay. Um, we can actually handle that one, and then what I was going to try and do is um, ask people after we uh, respond to Sarah's question, since it's now out there, if it's possible to respond to it now, um, to try and focus on. Um, housing questions, what is anticipated for the property and try and hold the financial questions to later than if CRC members um, are squeezed in time since our meeting for the finance committee is continuing afterwards. I wanted to make sure that we got get to the questions that are of the greatest uh, relevance to um, CRC sort of at the beginning. So, um, uh, once uh, if there's a response to Sarah's question. Um, I, have, I have a response if you want to hear it. Hey, please, Sonia, go ahead. Sarah is correct. Um, even though the funds are going into the um, housing trust, it is CPA funding and it's still held to the same, the same regulations of CPA. It has to be spent on CPA purposes. And is the... Um, Anything related to the management, including the specific topic that Sarah raised regarding um, if we have to uh, do a payout to uh, uh, tenants who are currently in that one house, is that a permissible use of the CPA funds related to this project? That's one I think we need to run by town by the town attorneys because I'm not sh sure when it's relating to a purchase of a property, 
Has Sharon weighed in on that, David? No, I, I would prefer, this is a great question, but I don't think any of us have the answer to it. And I think I would prefer to, to put it in our list of questions. Um, it is certainly, it is certainly a, um, it is certainly a, a legal, legally related uh, cost to developing affordable housing. Um, so I think we need to check with our town council, with our town attorney and see uh, what Sharon Everett knows about uh, past practices and, and uh, you know, eligibility for that cost, uh, you know, so if we could put that one in the, uh, in that, that uh, box, we'll, we'll research that. Okay. Mandy, thank you. Uh, Mandy, with your hand up, so. Yeah, thank you. Um, first, I, I just want to acknowledge that Shalini has joined us. Um, so, so we do have Shalini, our fifth committee member here. Um, on a related question, I'm, I'm just going to start with my questions. It relates to if we purchase this property with CPA money, um, I have a couple of questions about what its use can be. And so I'm going to try and group them. If, say, there is no interest in building affordable housing on it, like we have a problem with E Street School right now, if say the RFP doesn't work out or whatever, what are the options the town has for the use of the land is my first question. My second one is with the use of CPA money and it looks like holy CPA money to purchase this land, um, can a building, can an RFP actually have a requirement for workforce, non AD AMI or lower units in it? Or will the entire building and all buildings, including the houses on the property right now, have to be affordable in that CPA required capital A, as John Hornick likes to say, affordable manner of 80% AMI or lower? Um, I think I think those are my two questions sort of related to how does the sole use of CPA money relate to what we can do with this property and the RFPs? So I think I can start on that. Maybe John might want to jump in or, or Sonia. Um, let me see. I, I may need a little help going back to your questions there, um, Mandy Joe. But so your first question was about, um, so if the, if the, if the if all the land is purchased with CPA dollars, it does need to be used for um, affordable housing purposes. Um, if the town, so I guess if the town were unsuccessful in one or more RFP processes and decided that at some point um, um, the land could not be used for that purpose, I think the land would probably have to be sold and the uh, those proceeds put back in the CPA fund. Okay. Um, your, your other question, I think, was related to can there be a mix of affordable and non-affordable units? My understanding is that there can be, even though this the money for the purchase of the land is coming from CPA. John didn't get into leveraging, but the amount of leveraging that um, will come from this is many, many fold, um, you know, we're talking millions of dollars here. The town might invest, you know, let's say 850 in this property and the legal and, and other related costs, but to actually build 40 units on that land is going to be millions of dollars that the town will not have to put in. The state or the developer will leverage from the state and federal government those dollars. So, um, so, so there is an opportunity to look at mixed use, I think to some degree that would be up to the trust to work uh, on both properties to decide, um, are they looking for a 100% affordable complex? Uh, and how, do, how does the budget work out with regard to that? Or, or is there a mix of uh, affordable units and market rate units? And John, I don't know if you wanna add to that or, or tell me I'm wrong. Um, no, I, I think what you said is correct, Dave. Um, when we drafted the RFP that went out for the East Street school site, which we will now redraft, and at the same time we're drafting a new RFP for Belchertown Road and putting them together, we did allow for the possibility that the developer might want to propose 
a uh, mixed rate housing unit that would include um, some market rate units and some affordable units. Uh, there had to be a minimum of affordable units of 50% of the total. Uh, and we also had a, a hard number of uh, 15 actual affordable units. So it's possible that the housing trust will decide to do the same thing here. What I will say, which I think is part of your question, Mandy Joe, is the units that are market rate will not be subsidized. We can't expect that the Department of Housing and Community Development will provide money to the developer for the purpose of the units that go above 80% uh, area median income. I also want to say Again, going back to the example of 132 Northampton Road, they provided a mix of allowable air, uh, incomes from I think 30% AMI to 80% AMI. And the expectation was that people at the level of 80% AMI would actually be working. So at that level, you do get workforce housing. They're working at jobs that don't pay very well um, in the town of Amherst in the case of that development in order to be able to qualify. So I think if we have a limitation of 80% AMI, it's not that uh, nobody in that development is gonna work. Um, we would expect to open it, I think, again, I'm speaking for the housing trust, which is yet to actually draft the RFP, but I would hope that we would expect that uh, it will be set up so that there are working people who could be in these units. Sonia, do you know whether the affordable, uh, whether the Community Preservation Act, and Sarah can answer, the, might answer this question too, does it refer to community housing or affordable housing in the requirements of uh, use for this? Purpose. It's community. And is that is that a defined term in the statute or regulations? I believe so, yes. So I'll double check, but I'm gonna say yes if I'm wrong. Andy, my understanding is that you, you can use CPA funds going up to a hundred percent AMI. Um, how you would do that when you're mixing it with a significant amount of state funds, I'm not sure. Okay, uh, so uh, Bob Hegner, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just, I had two questions. The, the, the first question is, uh, I'm a little confused by the numbers now in terms of how many affordable units that we're actually gonna have versus how many total units that can be supported on the property. So my understanding is property can support 40 total units some of which may or may not be affordable. They, some of which may be market. So I think we need to clarify what those numbers actually are. And I guess the second question I have uh, relates to the zoning and whether you anticipate there would be any concerns by the abutters or by the, uh, the, the property owners, like there's a couple of apartment buildings across the street um, would those owners have any issues with uh, potentially competing units or things like that? Andy, maybe I could take the first one and start on the second and, and Rob might be able to comment on how this would go through the process. So I think I, while I appreciate all the, the interest in the number of units and I know that's, that's the prize, right? That's what we all want. We want units. There is really just no way at this stage in this project or in the E Street project that we can know the number of units. We don't, we can't know how many on Deltertown Road and we can't know how many exactly on E Street School and therefore we, we won't know the total. That's why we've been using ranges. And therefore we, we also don't know um, whether there might be a mix of affordable and market rate units. These are all things that will come out in the RFP process and the responses we get from that process. So 
I know it's a little bit frustrating for all of us to say, well, how many units are we going to get? Because then you can drill down into, well, that's an investment of $20,000 per unit, which is very, very reasonable and, and quite low for, for Amherst. But um, I just want to put it out there that we're using ranges based on what we learned over at East Street School. If you recall that process, that was a very rigorous process. And Kuhn Riddle was hired to help uh, uh, help us explore what is possible on the East Street School pro uh, property, which includes the old East Street School itself. And there were a number of different scenarios outlined by Kuhn Riddle. And I would encourage any of you to look back. All of that is online. And I think their range was, I want to say, and John can help me, somewhere in the high 20s, 27, 28 units to maybe 35, 36, depending on the scenario with the East Street School. And then even with the East Street School, that brought in uncertainties of cost. Um, because as we know, sometimes renovating an old structure can be more expensive than just demoing it and starting new. So I, I just want to put it out there that we're using ranges. We know from uh, Rob's analysis and the work that he had contractors do on the site with wetlands, there is a significant portion of the Belchertown Road project, uh, property, properties that is high, dry, has good frontage, and we would, or excuse me, the developer would then need to take this through the 40B process, not unlike uh, what 132 uh, Northampton Road went through. And Rob, do you wanna talk a little bit about how that might look? What would, what would a developer do uh, from there? Sure, uh, so th it's an application to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, and, you know, that's the time where we, we are uh, required to provide notice to all the abutting properties and, and really, truly get their feedback. Um, of course, there's no way to anticipate what the reaction would be. What we do know is that the investors uh, on the prop that own the properties directly to the south at Colonial Village and then to uh, the west are looking to either redevelop or uh, increased density on their properties themselves. Uh, so I, you know, I would be less concerned about uh, this looking to be competition for those developers and maybe even encourage them to uh, move ahead with their plans that they have already begun uh, being right at the border of the village center zoning district. Um, our project along with other pro potential projects there could really be a nice uh, way to serve a need in that part of town. Uh, but it's a pretty lengthy uh, Zoning Board of Appeals uh, process. Uh, the last one mentioned 132 Northampton Road, went through several months, uh, many, many sessions. Uh, that's typical. The board is um, uh, uh, equipped and um, familiar with the 40B process. This, this one uh, wouldn't be their first, neither was 132 Northampton Road. Uh, so it is a very lengthy, uh, uh, thought out, uh, co uh, complete process on the uh, potential land use, uh, which would include the other boards and committees as well as advisory to the, uh, to the whole uh, permitting process. Okay, Angelos. Thank you. Just a, a quick clarification. Um, I believe this would be, the answer would be, it would come out in the RFP process. But when you talk about a range of 40 units um, and refer to 132 Northampton Road, are you talking about a single size unit or would there be a range of from studio to two bedroom or anything like that? Um, and it also might be very much easier to go through the 40B process here because it's a working class neighborhood and you're not gonna get the same kind of elitist resistance that we got to 132 Northampton Road. Uh, John, perhaps John could speak to units and what the trust knows from their work. Yeah, again, if we look back to what we did with the East Street site RFP, um, we asked the developer to create a plan which had one, two, and three bedroom units with a preponderance of two bedroom units. And the reason for that is that uh, information from wayfinders from their Amherst properties indicated that two bedroom units had the longest waiting lists. So that's what we hoped we could encourage a developer to do. Thank uh, you. Sorry? No, I just said thank you. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, I will add that, um, as Rob said earlier, it's great to have the work that he did for us because it gives us an idea of what, what might happen on the property. But once we contract with the developer, things can change dramatically. I mean, if you look at the changes at 132 Northampton Road, um, when they were initially deciding what to do, they were gonna use the house and retain the house and add on to it in order to create the 28 units that they intended to um, have at the end of the day. And after several months and two different architects they wound up saying, no, we really can't use the house. We have to start over. Um, and also they had very elaborate plans for the property. I know I sat in on the ZBA meetings and um, I think they did an extraordinary job of talking about not only what was gonna happen with the house and what that would look like, but also with what the entire property would look like. And so, um, as again, I appreciate what Rob's done, but once a developer comes in there, um, they're gonna do a very detailed analysis of what uh, they think is the best way to take advantage of that property and what's the best way to construct something. Hopefully that would be 40 units, maybe it'll be a little bit more, maybe it'll be a little bit less. Um, it's really hard to say because I'm not a developer. And that's why we hire somebody else to do this work. Uh, Bernie Kubiak. Yeah, um, I'm reminded of what uh, Will Rogers said. You, know, you, know, you always want to buy land because they ain't making any more of it. Uh, <laughs> and I think you guys did a great job locating this property and um, I've been told by more than one builder that the biggest constraint for creating affordable housing in Amherst is the cost per acre or the availability of property. So, so um, that said, it's really difficult to argue about this location. My question though is how, um, how wedded are, are, is the group to uh, requiring this to be developed along with East Street School or will a developer be given an option to respond to one property, but not the other? Uh, <clears throat> um, uh, to be blunt, my concern is around the requirements that we reuse East Street School, which I see as a real chore. Uh, I know that's, I'm being a heretic, I understand that, and I expect the pitchforks to be outside my front door before too long. But um, my concern is that tying those two properties together is gonna cause uh, uh, won't get us the maximum bang for the buck that we could get from this property alone. Maybe I could start and then turn it over to John. Um, so th those are great questions, Bernie, and we're exploring those as we go. Um, we're, we're putting out there the possibility of bundling these. We want to keep our options open. If, if the council um, in their wisdom see that this is a, a good way for the town to proceed and to buy this property, then it gives us the opportunity to look at bundling the, the two properties. Rita Farrell, who is a, a consultant to the trust, I know is on this call listening. She has worked in, in the affordable housing field in Massachusetts for uh, more than 20 years and is an expert on this uh, throughout many communities and has helped us for years. Um, so we would work with Rita, with the trust to explore. And, and also John has, has already reached out to some affordable housing developers in the region to say, uh, if we were to pick this up, uh, what doors does this open for us? Uh, is it good? Would it be better to bundle these? Because of course, if you can bundle, you can presumably reduce legal costs and closing costs and, and the potential for more units. The number that we hear pretty consistently is, is north of 40 units. The higher 40 and above is a really good number. If you can get 50, 60, 70 units, then the cost per unit and the cost of developers comes down and it really makes projects doable as you look for the tax credits from the state and, and funding from the federal and state governments. So we are, we're keeping the bundling option open, but we haven't uh, hooked the, the, the wagon to that. And I think it'll be some 
probably a few months before we know more about that. And John, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Is, is that accurate as you see from the trust standpoint? I, I think that's accurate. I want to respond to something, an, an assumption that I think Bernie made, which is that to develop the East Street School site means you have to keep the East Street School. That is not the case. Um, we are open to not keeping the East Street School, and we are particularly concerned about, honestly, the costs for somebody doing so. Um, we are going to have a report on the amount of asbestos and lead that's in the building and uh, about other barriers to reusing the school. And we may simply go forward and tell developers that we simply don't expect that them to go through, or we may give them uh, the data that we have available and ask them to tell us whether they think the school should continue. Um, as you said, Bernie, that's kind of heretical, um, but it is something that we will definitely be considering. Um, I mean, there are other reasons to combine the two sites because they're close together. They may allow some economies of scale in the building process for the developer. Uh, as Dave mentioned, we're looking for low-income housing tax credits to subsidize this development. And there is a sweet spot um, when you look at this as a problem, the problem really is paperwork. Nobody is really enthusiastic about being doing paperwork for a development that's small uh, because there's a huge amount of paperwork that's required of the developer and of the Department of Housing and Community Developments and possibly others who touch on this process. So as a consequence, having more units to develop is really a huge advantage. And that's one reason for combining the two sites. And I, again, from my discussions with various people, I think that's a very significant reason to combine them. But my colleagues on the housing trust have yet to consider that or to weigh in on that. I'm just giving my personal opinion. Okay. Um I'm going to just make one statement and then if there's, um, it doesn't need an answer unless uh, my assumption is wrong. And that is that Coon Riddle or the town, that the current East Street School building has no historic preservation uh, attachments to it that would interfere with our ability to just uh, remove the building, if that's the best thing. Um, I know we have a number of hands up. I uh, wanted to ask Lynn um, if she could uh, bring Rita Farrell into the meeting, since Rita is a consultant to the town and to the trust, and she has her hand raised. Um, and then I'll uh, go while well, she's doing that. Uh, Lynn, did you have a question? Were you waving your hand because you had a question? I did. I do have questions, and unfortunately, I uh, because I'm doing the other stuff. I can't raise my hand because the function's not there. Um, at this point, the housing trust owns or has possession of East Street School, and I'm assuming, and that's by by vote of the council. I'm assuming, or please describe to me who will own this property and at what phases along the way. That's one question. A second question for me goes back to the assumption of 2% um, rate of vacancy and wondering how current that is and whether that has been affected by COVID and the uh, lack of students renting um, or maybe they are renting, but. I just wonder if it's been affected by COVID and therefore, is it a reliable number or is it worse or better? Um, so those are two of my questions. And then my third one is, I, and I think the answer is gonna be no, so I'll just accept that. But is there any opportunity with this property to create housing that leads to 
home or condo ownership? Uh, I can try. Oh, you want to answer those, Dave? Let me let me take a shot, John, at a couple of them and, and see where I go and, and fill in the, the blanks. Um, so in terms of who will own the property, Lynn, it's a great question, and, and I want to be clear. So the purchase and sale agreement is with the town of Amherst. Uh, it was signed by the town manager, and the closing would be with the town of Amherst and not the trust. Again, the trust is part of the town. We are collaborating together. I want to really make that clear. Um, unlike, say, a nonprofit, we, we've, we've enjoyed a wonderful relationship with the Kestrel Trust. They are a 501c3 nonprofit. They have given maybe millions of dollars to the town for open space. That is a completely different relationship. This is a relationship whereby the trust and its holdings, financial holdings, are controlled and managed by Sonia Aldridge's office. And, and so it would be the town of Amherst closing on the property. The town of Amherst would then own the 2.66 acres and they would be managed by the town of Amherst until such time as um, we decide on a pathway through the disposition, uh, uh, the disposition um, process. So um, we would likely in, uh, stay engaged with the current rental uh, management company, uh, that's Kendrick uh, Properties. Um, uh, we would likely have them continue to, to manage the rental property on site and that the town of Amherst uh, likely working through Rob's office would oversee other things on the property to make sure it's, you know, it's secure, it's, it's, you know, kept up, et cetera, as we work through the RFP process. It would only be at which time we decide on the pathway forward that um, decisions would come back through the council to decide on, do we need to transfer the land to the trust and ultimately to developer X? Is there a long-term lease? There are many uh, branches on that tree that we haven't explored yet. I did just want to also put out there that um, two, two things related to that. Uh, questions have arisen about um, property tax. The three properties currently right now pay about 14 or close to $15,000 in property tax every year. A question was posed to us through one of the meetings. Uh, if a building were built on or buildings were built on the, uh, on the property, uh, how much would that bring in? Uh, I think the short answer to that is it depends. It depends on the size of the building. Let's say it's one building with 40 units. Uh, it depends, the, uh, the assessor's office assesses a building like that based on the rents that are charged within that building. So a lot of the assessment will depend on the composition of one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three bedrooms that are ultimately in the building. What we can say from looking at say 132 Northampton Road, I believe that property um, prior to it being bought by Valley CDC pay down the order of about $5,000 a year. Um, Valley CDC estimated through the zoning uh, board of appeals process and, and other questions that came about uh, that that would ultimately pay four or four to five times as much in property tax. So I think that's a general rule that once a multi-million dollar building that has multiple units in it is built on this property, it would bring in far greater than the current $14,000 it is, it is um, currently bringing in in tax revenue. I also want to put out there that in the interim, while the town is renting at least one of the, the, the houses on site, perhaps two, we don't know that yet, that rental income will also come into the town of Amherst. Where that rental income goes, I would work with Son Sonia and Sean on where that rental income goes, but the rental currently, uh, if you subtract the property management fee, which is about 15%, is probably on the order of $18,000 a year. So some people have said, well, while the town owns it, do we lose the tax revenue? We do, but we would still have more than that in rental income coming in. There would be some maintenance to the house, et cetera, et cetera, um, but, but we, could, we, could, um, we could address that through the rental. So anyway, um, and I guess I would turn over to John or 
others on the call about rate of vacancy. I don't know, John, you want to say anything about that? I probably am not going to say much about that in town. Uh, I, I don't have a current number. The number that we had on the slide comes from Nate Malloy and Nate is not on. My guess is that the vacancy rate would probably be somewhat higher right now because of the COVID epidemic. We have certainly heard about college students simply abandoning rentals in town. Uh, so uh, you're probably correct. On the other hand, I believe everybody's expectation is, let's say by next fall, when assuming the university and the colleges are going at full enrollment, that everything that might be vacant today uh, or virtually everything will be rented and we go back to the 2% situation. I mean, again, that's speculation on my part. I, I did want to answer one other question you have is, could we put up some form of workforce housing on this property? Um, the big question for that would be, well, why would you, I say two questions. One would, why would you do that instead of uh, fam uh, housing for families and individuals who are low income. I mean, that's a value choice. I think this particular property is especially helpful for people in those circumstances because of its location uh, on public transportation. I think if the town has another piece of property and it might, where we could put up, say, workforce condos, so to speak, it's possible we could get financing for that from mass housing finance. Honestly, I don't know much about it, but I am at least aware that they have a workforce program that goes up, I believe, to 120% of area median income, which is significant, um, which they would substitute, which they will offer money uh, that essentially allows a subsidy so that families at that level um, could be housed. And, um, and that, that I believe is a home ownership program. Yeah, okay, I'm gotcha. not I'm sure because like I said, I, I need to be more familiar. And I think that's something the trust will be looking into. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, John, you know from a previous conversations that, you know, as we look at the issue of racial equity and social justice, of accumulating wealth with a home or a condo is part of achieving that goal. And um, I think we need to be looking into those options. But thank you. So I wanted to introduce Rita Farrell uh, to everybody. Uh, so, uh, Rita is a uh, select board member in one of our neighboring communities, uh, Shitsbury, but uh, more importantly, she's had a um, lifetime career or a long career working in affordable housing and um, worked very closely with uh, my former fellow select board member, Connie Kruger, and uh, uh, she has been uh, working with, along with the, and assisting the Housing Trust. And I gather from your hand up that you had some um, comments on questions that have been previously raised, Rita. Yes, um, and uh, thank you for that introduction. So I want to clarify a couple of things because I think this is really important. Um, you're using CPA money and CPA money come for, for the acquisition. And so CPA money comes with a lot of statutory requirements. And I'm going to read um, just a couple of sentences here that um, I think are germane to the discussion. So any property any real property interest acquired with CPA funds must be owned by the municipality, but management of that interest for affordable housing properties may be delegated to the housing authority or nonprofit organization, which means um, uh, really because the property is being acquired with CPA funds, uh, then a long-term lease rather than an outright sale would um, be in play here. Um, secondly, you know, we've been talking about, uh, or you have been talking about affordability and the level of affordability and whether or not workforce housing. Um, the CPA guidelines say that, you know, the maximum area median income is 100% is of the maximum area um, income. Permanent deed restriction is required when you acquire with CPA. 
and real property interests acquired in whole or in part with community preservation monies must be bound by a permanent deed restriction that limits the use to the CPA purpose for which it was acquired and runs with the property in perpetuity. So you could not do anything over 100% of AMI given that this property is being acquired in whole with CPA funds. In some developments, you know, the, um, the, the ten, you know, towns have put X number of dollars into a um, affordable housing development and designated uh, certain of those units um, as being, you know, CPA units. But in the case where you're acquiring land, um, it's very different. So I wanna make sure that's clear. Now, um, E Street School has no CPA money in it. It's not to say that it couldn't, um, you know, if it's part of this development or it's, it's separate, um, that there might not be some CPA funds needed for the E Street School. But it doesn't have the same requirement because the property is, is a town owned property. So I wanted to make sure that was understood. Okay. Well, thank you, Rita. Um, I'm going to continue on because we have about uh, five more people with hands up right now, and I'm going to continue on the list in order. So, Dorothy Pam? You're muted, Dorothy. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions. First, uh, the land abutting it is called farmland conservation. And is that a special kind of conservation? And if so, I'm just, it's the word farm there that I'm interested in. What does that mean, farmland conservation? Um, Dorothy, I'm not sure what map you're looking at, but you might be looking at a zoning map. There might be a farmland overlay district in that area, but the, the property to the north and to the east is owned, already owned by the town of Amherst. It's called the um, Fort River Farm Conservation Area. Well, there's the word and, farm in there. That's that's what I'm yeah. asking. So I read River it from farm. the chart today. So yeah, what does that, that mean? About, well, we bought that about five years ago, and mm -hmm. it's being developed into community gardens. Uh, there'll okay. be a trail system there, and then uh, it is possible that we may rent out portions of the property to farmers for small um, pilot um, uh, projects for them. You know, some, some farmer wants to get on a half an acre of land, but they can't afford land prices in this area, but they want to they wanna get their hands dirty and their feet wet. Um, mm -hmm. That was designed or purchased for that purpose. Okay, so, so it's not, I, I guess it, in my mind, I thought that that land was classified as wetlands, but it is not. Um, the, the small farm thing, my daughter got started with a one leased acre in Hadley. Now they mm -hmm. have grown tremendously. So that would be a great use. There are so many farmers that need that start. So my yeah. second question has to do with that same map. Um, if you could put it up again, um, because the first times I saw it, I read it completely wrong and I can't figure out what the middle stuff is. Um, the square, the, the building is gonna be in the plain red box. And the other stuff is either parking or lawn or playground. And there was one area that was very complex, kind of in the middle of some grass. I had no idea what that was. Um, Maybe Sean, I'm not, or Lynn, who's ever controlled, uh, could put up the development potential map again. I'm working on it. <laughs> All right. And because um, that I wanted to look at. The other thing is, I've been told it, but I've forgotten it. 80% uh, of AMI is approximately how much money? Uh, it depends on the number of people in the household. Yes. But if I recall correctly, and this changes year after year, right, right. Um, it's probably around $70,000 annual income for a family of four. Okay, that's, that's money. Okay. So great. Rob, Rob is back on, and 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 this is Rob's drawing concept drawing. Do you want to tackle that first question, Rob? Uh, yes. Uh, so the the red uh, box outlined in red, the white box outlined in red, is uh, shown as a potential building site. Mm -hmm. uh, all of the gray uh, is either driveway and parking spaces, right around there. 
Uh, mm -hmm. The green is just a, a background color to kind of give some contrast to those two elements. Um, that um, line that kind of goes all over the place, uh, starting from the uh, midpoint on the eastern boundary uh, and, and goes in a little bit and jags around like mm -hmm. a boot and then back up around is showing the wetland boundary. I see. Uh, the hatching up on the north uh, side there is a, a flood zone uh, located there. Uh, and, and then shaded in the background are the other, the existing structures uh, that you kind of see underneath these images. Uh, yeah, and throughout the green area, um, there's markings for a potential playground area or picnic area, uh, that type of uh, outdoor space. Uh, what is the, um, the area in the middle of the gray that has that, what is that? Those are parking spaces. Uh, the darker areas are actually, if it were zoomed in, you'd see the hatch marks on them. They're mm -hmm. indicating a accessible parking space, the loading zone okay. next to an accessible parking space. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just reserving the area needed for, uh, for those spaces. Um, I guess I was wondering if, because it seems like the parking takes up an awful lot of the piece of land. Um, and I guess I was looking for more of a sense of some common shared green um, in connection to the building. Um, and I know this is just a temporary design, but um, w whether and the land underneath the parking has to be of a certain type. Are there, are there other options for how the parking could be done in a less um, intrusive way and more of the, the green land be um, around the uh, apartments? There will be many options. Uh, you know, we ourselves had various concepts with uh, two buildings, two smaller footprints mm -hmm. uh, with parking between or off to the east. Uh, we had concepts with the driveway coming in on the west side uh, before we learned, um, before we had the wetland delineation and saw that mm -hmm. there was even more area that potentially could be developed than we originally thought. So there absolutely would be a number of probably different ideas that uh, the developers design team will be able to present uh, moving forward with this. Right. Okay. Th thank you very much. Um, okay. uh, Jeremy Baldwin. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so I'm concerned about uh, what's stopping affordable housing workforce developers. And I heard two things today. One is uh, the paperwork and then the cost is I think with Bernie, I couldn't really make out, but I think it was about cost. So my question was, um, do we have other properties other than East Street that are not being used and could be developed for affordable housing. And my other question was, how do we advertise and try to get developers in affordable housing? Because it does seem like there is affordable housing. There are developers who are really committed to it. And it's just like, maybe we're just not reaching them. So what is our process for reaching out to them? How do we advertise it? Um, uh, uh, let me let me jump in there first, um, Shalini. So so again, all good questions. Um, you know, yeah. I, I mean, developing any any property in in Amherst or any town, Northampton, you know, it, it begins with a, a series of decisions, and and certainly the cost of land and the cost of development. We you you and I have been on many many meetings where this has come up with the chamber with the bid. Um, so the cost of land and the availability of land is very key in Amherst. And John spoke to this a few minutes ago. Um, you know, and I say this a lot, which is I firmly believe, you know, our future lies in the redevelopment of land in our village centers. Mm -hmm. This is redevelopment in our village centers. You know, for a whole host of reasons, it doesn't make sense for us to spread out at the very least, the, perhaps the most important one is global climate change. Every time you move horizontally on the land, you need to expand water, sewer, electricity, pavement, all of those infrastructure costs and uh, the maintenance of those and the environmental impacts of those. So here is a property in the village center that has been used for a whole host of things, most recently two rental houses that we are saying isn't this a higher and better use now to do dense housing in a village center? Um, 
I wish we could bring down the cost of things. I mean, Massachusetts has one of the highest development costs in the country for any kind of uh, residential development. And that's a bigger nut than we're gonna crack here today. But I think I wanna go back to something John said a few moments ago, which is Valley CDC spent two years looking for a piece of property and they found 132 uh, Northampton Road and kudos to them for finding it and taking it this far, it was not easy. We just started this, I don't know, John, when did we start this, in October? In um, October, I believe. Dave. October. So here we are on January 5th. We have a closing date of February 16th. We are moving at lightning speed if we decide to move forward with this. Um, and that will give us a huge leg up because we haven't, looking for land for two years has a cost. That's a staff cost. We have, in, we, have, we have put in some staff time. John is volunteering his time. Rita is there with us. Um, but here we are uh, on the cusp of saying, this is a really good piece of property that is affordable to us and can translate into units that are at an affordable cost per unit. 20 to $30,000 per unit in the end is very affordable for the town of Amherst. And we hope a developer will be will be very interested in that. John has already reached out to a few developers and I don't know if you wanna say anything about that, John, and, and kind of talked about this a little bit and there's certainly interest in this moving forward. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll stop there, but um, there were other parts to your question that maybe John can, can address or, or Rob or Rita. Yeah, I'll just say um, a couple of things. One is that formally, um, the procurement is the responsibility of Anthony Delaney, who works for the finance department. So Anthony is responsible for releasing the RFP. And I believe at least one of the things that he does is to put it on the state website mm -hmm. so that people who are interested in this will find it there and become potential bidders. I know I talked to a couple of people that I ran into at a JAPA meeting who said uh, this was flagged for them by somebody on their staff and they did look at it. This was the E Street School RFP, um, but ultimately decided not to bid. Um, I, we do have the expectation that at least Valley Community Development will bid and they're a perfectly good developer, but we'd like to attract more. I spent some time, actually Rita and I spent some time talking to Peter Graham. Peter Graham is somebody who has been a developer, but currently is the director of an organization called MBL Consulting. What they do is assist small developers primarily in figuring out how to finance a project that they're working on. So uh, all of this is a pretty arcane business and there are specialties that develop in, in, in each part of it. Anyway, as I said, I talked to Peter and I asked him for some recommendations for people we might talk to both within Massachusetts and outside. So I have a list of names and contacts. Um, I've yet to follow through with that because I've been busy with this and other things related to the emergency rental assistance program and the trust generally, but Rian and I do intend to make contact with those other people. And so we hope to bring interest from uh, more potential developers than we had at the East Street School site originally. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Because uh, otherwise, I uh, back to uh, CRC Chair Mandy Johanneke. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move off of the affordable housing part of this for a little bit because CRC has deals with what the land use is. So one question about the farm conservation area that's behind it, and you've talked about creating trails in that area, and I know you've talked about Fort River Elementary being close. Would it be possible to create a trail through the conservation area to Fort River so that anyone needing to get there doesn't have to walk along the sidewalk on Belchertown Road, number one. Number two, about that transportation on Belchertown Road. I know a lot of people who are afraid to bike on Belchertown Road, and I know there's some state potential issues um, looking into redoing Belchertown Road. Would a project like this, um, I guess, help 
the redoing or help the ability to move forward on the redoing of Belchertown Road to really make Belchertown Road safe for not only waiting at bus stops, um, but also biking along the road and walking along the sidewalks that don't feel safe to a lot of people. Like what, what, what are, what would we, like, what are the results, I guess, of either this project or ensuring that people that are at this project, but also Colonial Village and the other areas around have actual safe access to the village center and to bus stops? And mm. is there a cost associated with that? Hmm. Uh, that's a lot, Mandy Jo. Um, <laughs> I think we would all agree um, if you've driven or ridden your bike or walked along Belchertown Road in that section, it is, um, I don't know, is it a moonscape? I'm not sure what it is, but it is is—it is a mess. Um, I do know that Guilford uh, Mooring, our superintendent of public works has been working with the state on, on future plans there. Um, uh, they have had uh, survey points out there for some time, those big, um, uh, I believe those big white squares are part of that whole process. And I believe there is money moving forward um, in, in state processes to redo that section. I have not, uh, Rob nor I have not been involved in that at, at any level. I'm not sure whether this project, it certainly could be, it could be added to the urgency, but I'm not sure this is gonna put anything over the top. I think that state process will move like other state processes do and it'll eventually happen. Um, you know, I do know I was somewhat involved in the Route 9, um, the redevelopment of Route 9, um, um, you know, from the center of Amherst down to the Hadley line. And the state was very open and receptive to improve crosswalks, improve bike lanes, improved um, um, uh, pedestrian safety, et cetera. So I, I, I have confidence that those elements will be there. And given the concentration of housing, residential housing, particularly apartment style residential housing there, you know, there are thousands of residents who live along that stretch in Aspen Chase and, and Colonial Village and then moving farther west uh, in the various apartment complexes uh, behind East Street School, et cetera. So, um, you know, I'm, I have a high confidence that those kinds of things are being worked into those plans. Your earlier question about connectivity to conservation land, again, uh, I try not to get too excited. If we were to acquire this property um, and then move forward with a development, I think we would then look at what are the possible connections to be made to the Fort River Farm Conservation Area other than the sidewalk. That is clearly a way to get people there. Your question about can we connect Fort River School with um, with the Fort River Farm Conservation Area. Absolutely, and if you go, if you really want to, you can go back to see my presentation at town meeting about five years ago. I made that case that we were going to try to do that. It's just a question of, it's on my list. I need to get it in the queue. Um, and you know, I'm sure Sonia and Sean will find uh, money for me to make that bridge happen. There is a stream between Fort River Farm Conservation Area and Fort River School. We need to put a bridge. It's not a huge bridge. It's not a station road bridge, but it's a bridge. Um, and I know that John loves to fund and JCPC love to fund bridges. So I'll, I'll be coming with a request. Okay, thank you. Okay, hey, uh, Kathy, you've uh, been escaped. You've escaped MSBA and you're with us now. You have your hand up. I do. And um, as everyone knows, I'm coming in late. So I'm going to, watch the tape later to, to try to avoid um, asking questions of everybody who asks. But I wanna um, follow up on what Rita told us about CPA money restriction. And John Hornick, during the an earlier public meeting, I asked about the 40 units and would they all be affordable or would some of them be market rate? And you had said the RFP might be 50 or 75% affordable, but I think Rita was just saying that they have to all be affordable. Did I hear that correctly? Because I'm talking about this property, not the part that's the East Creek rule. Did I hear that correctly? I think it was 100% of AMI was the answer. Right, so they can't go up, and but but not that, you know, uh, 
10% of the units would be market rate. It's it's everything. If we do succeed in getting 40 units, 100% of them would be in, you know, I understand that affordable can be 50% AMI, 80%, but I'm talking about uh, not any market rate, which you had answered, you just answered differently the other night. And I'm not going to hold you to what you said the other night, but I'm just trying to understand when Dave does the quick math of 800,000 divided by 40, what a good deal it is. I did, a, if it was only 50%, I'm going to divide 800,000 by 20, you know, in terms of how many units are affordable. So are we, we are constrained based on what I heard Rita say, because we're buying the whole, P, it's not CPA is buying half of it. Um, is that correct? We believe we are constrained, Kathy, but we are going to follow up on that and we'll get you a written response to that. And We're going to check with legal counsel on that. I don't, I don't have a problem with it. You know, it's not that I think that's a bad idea. It's more. Um, I wanted to be clear. Yeah. It's getting um, what what amount of uh, creativity do developers have? And I was very struck with Valley CDC on the small um, studios for single singles in 132. When I asked whether you could um, build the building in a way that two units sitting side by side, at least a few of them didn't share any electrical and plumbing so that if later on you decided you should have a one bedroom, you could just convert some of the units to one bedroom. And they said, that's a great idea in terms of design, but we can't make the financing work for the building if we don't have every unit paying, you know, the way we've done it, it had to be every unit paying a rent rather than some of them might be a two person unit and we combine two. So I'm just trying to understand um, the limits of the money we later go for, because the attraction of this is it's a bigger space and the square footage would allow one, two, three bedroom, not all small spaces. Is that still gonna be fairly attractive to de developers given what the state money funds? So that's my question, because if there is no market rate, it's it's, it's a different uh, business plan that they would have to come up with. Well, I would certainly defer to Rita. Um, when I answered you the other day, I think I was thinking about what we did at East Street site, which is, as Rita pointed out, not property that was purchased with CPA funds. And uh, I depend on Rita to set me straight uh, when I make mistakes and, I'm, and she will be our consultant in drafting the RFP. So whatever we have in there will be uh, consistent with what the regulations or the statute have to say. You know, I just want to be clear. I'm not against that. It's just, I think yeah. it, it's no. a little, it's another piece of risk because we didn't get um, a bid we loved on East Street, and it they had some flexibility. So um, the I had sent some questions in advance to you, but you know this this is potentially leveraging a lot of money. Um, if the leveraging and the money doesn't happen, is there after five years, after six years, is there some point at which we say, uh oh, it it just didn't happen, or um, you know, or we're pretty sure that leveraging can happen because of the location and the attractiveness of this property. So I'm, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, if, if you offer this to them, will they come <laughs> and will we get what we want out of it? Uh, I think so. The problem with E Street had to do with the fact that we couldn't answer questions that the developer had about wetlands and about the extent to which hazardous material, including asbestos and lead, were present in the building. And so they were uncertain about how to move forward on a bid. We are currently working to correct that so that when we go out with the East Street School, that information will be present. Um, again, I think that combining the two properties will make it attractive because it will be more attractive, honestly, to the Department of Housing and Community Development to finance their so-called regular uh, community incentive or tax program um, will be, uh, should be responsive to the larger size 
of the development that we can do when we combine the two properties. Now, obviously with respect to anything, there are many potential slips between uh, uh, you know, what we think will happen and what actually happens. It, it may be that we'll discover that we made some critical mistake that we weren't thinking about in the RFP and it's not attractive to any of the developers. Uh, so what do we do? I don't think we give up. I think we uh, look back at the RFP and look at what we need to change in order to make it attractive to a developer to come in and make the best use of these properties. I think both properties um, have plenty of advantages uh, you know, which Rob has really pointed out, and we should be able to find somebody to do this. Rita, you were you had your hand up to an yes. additional source. But... Thanks. Um, I think in, in answer to your question, Kathy, the greatest leverage you get is through low income housing tax credits, which um, John spoke about earlier. And what makes this development, and particularly if it can be bundled with E Street, um, both attractive to developers, but also um, very competitive for um, financing is size. So you achieve certain economies of scale uh, when you get to larger developments. And the reason being is that the transaction costs uh, in doing um, a tax credit development are so significant that the only way to kind of spread out those transaction costs is to have more units. And most developers who use um, the tax credit program will tell you that you need to have a minimum of 40 to 50 units in order to um, make it sort of worth their while and, you know, for those costs, again, to be spread out over a larger number of units. So I expect that, um, that this uh, development will, in fact, attract many more developers than, um, than E Street uh, as a standalone did, and that is because it's expensive. Um, John's pointed out there's a lot of uh, paperwork involved in doing affordable housing development. And if you're going to do 20 or fewer units, it just, you know, unless you have um, a lot of, of money and have a tremendous amount of subsidy, it just isn't worth the brain damage. There you go. Thank you, Rita. Um, I'm going to ask uh, one question that's going to Sonia mostly and also to Sarah. And then uh, at that point, uh, I think we all have circled around. I see that Dorothy's hand is still up, but I want to check with Mandy then about whether she wants to continue the CRC portion of the meeting. Uh, but to get to the question, have you, Sonia, calculated um, what you think that the annual amount that's going to be required from CPA is going to be to repay the anticipated note that's going to have to be issued, because that is the amount that will be then not available for other CPA purposes and community housing for the length of the loan. I, I did, but I need to find it before I can actually give you a number. And while she's looking, I'll just say that, you know, whatever CPA funds have to pay for the debt service, that money is not available for any purpose. It's not just not available for community housing. Um, but we, you know, we don't know exactly what the cost would be, but we uh, did spend quite some time kind of looking at our debt obligations, um, debt, existing and potential given our recommendations, uh, what those would look like over the next 10 years. So we, we can handle it. it. You know, there may be some years where there's a significant part of the CPA budget is going to debt service, but um, we think all these projects are worthy. So we can live with that. You have some current debt that you're paying that is expiring soon that will help lessen that burden? Yes. I can't, I mean, some of them are um, Q1 
community housing projects um, before my time, like the, they were 10 year notes that are uh, maybe Sh Sean knows, uh, like something was done to Rolling Green or we did something to enable some permanent, uh, create some permanent affordable units there. I think oh, there yeah, were repairs. I, Sorry? I, I, I pulled it up. Um, yeah. So if it's, if I'm looking at the right one, um, the first payments for this would be 112,000 would be the first year and then it would start to go down from there. And that was based on a higher number because the original estimate that we had for CPA was at um, was 800,000. Yeah. So it'll actually be no more than that. It'll end up being less than that once we do the actual borrowing. And it was also using a very conservative interest rate, which we know if we move relatively quickly with this, the interest rate will come in much better as well. And then there are a number of projects that will come off the books in the next few years. Yeah, um, and Whalen also. And yeah, there's an Amherst Housing Authority one. Um, yep, Ann Whalen comes off an FY24. Rock Farm comes off an FY24. Kiaris, um, looks like that's gonna be paid off in FY23. So there's a, there's a number of projects um, with existing debt from CPA that'll be rolling off in the next two to three years. Dave, did you have something? Um, yeah, Andy, um, I know you, I, I think we're nearing closure, at least on this discussion. I just, there were two things that I that were kind of touched upon that I just wanted for the record to put out there. And now that Kathy is here too. Um, one is that um, if we look at these two properties, East Street School, which as we've said, really was a longstanding town property, came to us from the schools, um, uh, was an elementary school, uh, was not purchased with CPA dollars. And then we have Belchertown Road, which if we look at a total acquisition uh, and, and other costs at 850, I believe uh, one of the finance committee members asked about, so what is the total, if we are bundling these and putting this out there, what is the value of the East Street School property? And it's one thing to look at the assessed value. Um, I won't go into, I'm not an expert on assessing, but the market value of East Street School currently, um, staff and I threw this around a little bit earlier today. And if, if we put that out on the market right now, I mean, we think that it would certainly sell below half a million dollars, maybe in the 200, 200 and maybe $300,000 range. It's not a high value property. It's a very oddly shaped property. It has the liability of the school. So just for round numbers, if we think about the town's donation, the town's contribution to this project of affordable housing, if we bundle them, is approximately a million dollars if we move forward with Belchertown Road. If we think of it in the range of a million dollars, let's keep in mind that the developer might come back to the CPA in a future year and say, we need a cash contribution of X um, to move this forward. So. This might not be the last, if we bundle these and, and we find a developer, which we, we hope we, we do, there may be another ask of CPAC that is a modest ask. If we look at other, other um, communities, uh, again, we're often compared to Cambridge. Cambridge is very creative and, and uses a tremendous amount of their CPA dollars and other funds toward affordable housing. Um, uh, these asks are regular and it's, as John said, we need to prime the, the pump and keep them moving through the pipeline. That was one point I wanted to make. The other point I realized I did not answer Chalonet's question about town land. We are, we have been and continue to look at already owned town property. That's where East Street School came from. That came from our inventory of town owned land. And we said in conversations with John and Rita a, year, a couple of years ago, hey, let's look at East Street. There's a couple of other properties that the town owns. There's not a lot that are not encumbered. And by encumbered, I mean, they don't have a current use or they're not, uh, let me just, you know, uh, there's a couple of properties in North Amherst. There's one or two in South Amherst. Many of them we've already looked at with kind of a first um, lens. And what we find is we own them because somebody didn't want them. Typically, they're very wet or they have limited access. They're not large. Um, 
But then there's other properties. There's the North Amherst School, which comes up from time to time. We're currently leasing that out to some very worthy nonprofits serving uh, children and families in our community. There's the South Amherst campus, which we know is vacant on the, the South Amherst Common. We're gonna be looking at that with the town manager. What are some of the potential future uses of that? Um, there's the old Hitchcock Center building, which is a lovely old building, but really should probably be demolished. It is in such, it, it just, it's an old barn. It can't be reused for affordable housing and it comes with encumbrances uh, uh, on the deed. So we're looking at all of those, but Chalonet, none of them rise to the top of access, infrastructure, water, sewer, uh, electricity, bike, uh, bus routes, sidewalks. That's why this one jumped out at us and leapfrogged over anything we own other than East Street School. And that's why these two rise to the top together. So we're, we're not saying we're not looking at those other properties. Some of those might be more appropriate for a habitat house, but not for 40 units because there just isn't room on the property given the wetlands, the access, whatever, the setbacks. So we're still looking at those, but none of them scream 40, 50 unit affordable housing development. So I, I, I forgot to answer that question, I'm sorry. Thank you. So um, Mandy, did uh, what, what is your thoughts about how we proceed now? I, and I, I, I do wanna ask Dorothy if she has an additional question, but I wanna ask you first. I, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to ask my committee to raise their hands if they have any other questions um, or desire to not adjourn this meeting um, at this time of CRC, because I think I've seen the people who I know had questions have asked questions of CRC. So I'd like, uh, you know, if they, if they want to continue on the meeting or still have questions, please raise their hands in the raise hand section. Otherwise, I think I'm just going to adjourn the CRC portion the CRC meeting. Um, so I'll wait a little bit. And I'm not seeing any additional questions from CRC at all or any any indication that they want to continue on in this meeting. So I think it tells me that CRC has received the information it needs to go and deliberate next week on January 12th. Um, so with that, and your permission, in some sense, your permission, Andy, if you if you don't have anything else to add for CRC, I would adjourn CRC. I think that's uh, uh, up to you as the chair of CRC. What I was gonna do is ask Dorothy uh, to ask her question after CRC leaves, and then we're going to go into discussion on the finance committee um, of the issue. Uh, you have another meeting scheduled, I believe for the 12th of, January, in which CRC you're going will be back follow on. up on this uh, special meeting. Yes, CRC will be back on the 12th for deliberation and recommendation. Other, and with that, then at 3:39 p.m., I'm going to adjourn the CRC meeting. Thank you, CRC members. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Dorothy. You had a question. Uh, yes, this is in reference to. Um, projects which are desirable to developers. And, and I, let me just preface it by saying, I'm very excited about this new project. I think town donation of land is the way to go on these things. Um, but when Kathy was worried that from what something um, Laura Baker had said about um, 132 Northampton, that small unifying units were somehow more easy to do financially, um, and worried that the one, two and three bedroom uh, apartments might um, ward off, turn off developers. I'm thinking about Olympia Oaks and uh, is John, I hope John Hornick is still here. Um, I can't say, okay. Because that's a fabulous project. It's under Wayfinders. I've been there several times. Um, I know it's smaller, but it has, you know, variable sized units. And it was developed. I know it, I've heard it took a long time, but so I, I wanted to get a little uh, experience and knowledge from John on how that came about because it's a wonderful location, wonderful apartments, and there's a community building too, which is very, very nice. So how did that work out, John? Well, I, I, I've been there and toured the property and I agree that it's uh, a well-designed 
um, property and, and it works very well. Um, I, I have to say that I was not part of the development process, so I can't tell you exactly how it worked out. Uh, Dave would probably be in a better position than I am. Uh, the only thing I will say is that I think when the housing trust drafts an RFP, it will include a requirement for one, two, and three bedroom apartments with, as I said earlier, an emphasis on two bedroom apartments, right. like we did with the East Street RFP. So I don't want to go into great detail, Dor Dorothy, it's a great question. Uh, you don't want to know how many years um, that project start to finish, I think, took 25 years. Um, we got the land, we got the land from the university uh, with the intention of uh, someday doing affordable housing. Um, there were numerous kind of um, uh, processes through town meeting that eventually resulted in uh, Roy Rosenblatt, who was a wonderful staff member who worked for the town for many years in community development. Um, and I think Rita, I don't know uh, how involved you were with that project with Roy. Um, but I worked on it for maybe a couple of years as I was just coming on and it, it really brought together dozens and dozens of professionals and in the end I think there's 42 units there if I'm not mistaken 42 sounds like the number if I'm not mistaken, um, but it was the town donating the land. Uh, the, the, the property is surrounded, uh, not unlike Belchertown Road with some conservation land and trails. Um, we eventually were able to get the university to donate um, to us the uh, public way. So we now control the public way to Olympia Oaks. And then you have the adjacent development, which is private at Olympia Place. Right. Um, so Rita, Rita can probably give more details on that, but it, it really, that was a big win for Amherst, but it took a long time. Yep, it's still good. Sonia, did you have something? Yeah, I just want to clarify something on the debt service. The number that Sean gave you, that was when we were basing it on 800,000. It's now 600,000. So I just updated the projection and it's 84,000 is the first payment, which um, is at 4% estimate right now. And I'm pretty sure it'll come in lower. Okay. Um, just one, Andy, one other thing on Olympia Place, excuse me, Olympia Drive uh, development there. We, um, Olympia Oaks, we donated the land and then we also, um, we gave CDBG funds to the project. I'm not sure if we gave CPA, but we, I wanna say it was around three quarters of a million dollars. I, I don't re recall, it's been a number of years, but it was north of 500,000, I think that we put in, in terms of cash and then the, the, the land uh, itself. So Rita may have more details that I just can't recall at this time. I can, I can just add a, a couple of things. Um, uh, Wayfinders, which was then HAP, was picked through an RFP process and uh, Dave is correct. The town did, um, I think used about $350,000 in CDBG funds to do the infrastructure prior to the disposition of the property. Um, so it got some of the, um, I think the roads and, and utilities in there and there was additional CPA funds. All of the units at um, Olympia Oaks are affordable and um, I believe all of them are, are at or below 60% of area median income because it was financed with low income housing tax credits. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, Lynn, am I able to do a share screen and show something? Because uh, I want to move this along and I want to put up my version of the order because I highlighted something. If not, then you're able to share your screen. Okay, let me see, make sure that I have here it is. This is it. Okay. Go. So um for for everybody's um you, I hope you have seen this. This is the council order that's being proposed. And uh, what we're going to have to move to is a vote on the council order. And uh, 
I know that Bernie had his hand up and I am not neglecting that, but I wanted to get this at least out there because I think we need to move along to a conclusion. Um, and the reason that I highlighted the piece in yellow is uh, that the order sort of does two different things uh, or several different things uh, because one is it's approving the, C the CPA funding um, request and uh, but it's also a quiet, uh, dealing with the acquisition of the property and authorizing the acquisition of the property. And uh, I noted that when you get into it that the uh, amount of the, um, the that's, that's mentioned and that I put in highlight um, is the amount that's anticipated to come from CPA. It does not include the amount that's coming from the housing trust funds. And uh, does the, is there a problem in that um, the order doesn't include the actual purchase price of the land? And uh, is that a question that we need to ask before we approve the actual, recommend the actual wording of the order? Do you want me to answer that? Yes, please. So um, this is all already gone through with the town attorney and everything on there. And we went back and forth on this. And to keep it as simple as possible, this is just an appropriation from CPA, an authorization to borrow. As far as, as the um, trust is concerned, we don't have to appropriate funds from the trust. It's, it, money can be spent by a vote of the um, trustees of the trust. So after consulting with um, Sharin from KP Law, this is what we came up with. And this is what I need as the comptroller to, um, to book this budget for authorization. So it was just meant to keep it simple. All the, the presentation and the report that went along with this had the total purchase price. So it was transparent. Okay. So, so thank you. Uh, this is legal for from a finance perspective and a legal for the purchase. Um, so I just want to point out to everyone um, the obvious and uh, you know, I've worked with Sharin for years from um, KP Law. So if she's looked at it, I'm, I'm happy. But uh, just to just point out, the first paragraph authorizes the town manager to make a purchase of property. The second paragraph really is dealing with the um, authorization of the borrowing for the Community Preservation Act uh, funds. Then uh, the third uh, paragraph C has to deal with the conveying of um, allowing the long-term lease agreement and uh, then the fourth one is kind of a catch-all of other instruments that we were authorizing the town manager to do so that uh, what we're being asked to recommend is this order and I just wanted to make sure that it was up on the screen for a moment so that if there are any questions about it that um, you can uh, we can ask that. Um, I don't know if there are any other hands up at this point because um, since I'm sharing now, I've lost my participant list. You've got Bernie, Sarah, and Kathy. Okay, um, take them in that order, Bernie. Let's see if I can, oh, I can unmute myself. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, welcome Rita's involvement in this project. Uh, she and I met in the last century sometime working on affordable housing in Belchertown uh, and our paths have crossed from time to time. Uh, just a consummate professional and I feel very, very comfortable having her uh, helping us with this whole process. I'll second that, Bernie. <laughs> uh, Sarah, did you? Yeah, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm looking at paragraph C and it refers to 
a qualified purchaser. And I think we've been told that the town has to retain ownership of the property since it is purchased with CPA funds. So I'm wondering um, if it means something something other than than what's obvious to me, but I could be wrong. Well, part C also includes to lease all or a portion of said property. So it has both both there. Convey a fee or lease. But why would you say to a qualified purchaser if that's not an option? It just to a developer of community housing. I think that the question is, is the first part of the sentence under C has to do with conveying um, the fee or enter into a long-term agreement. And the question is, why have the first part of it convey the fee um, or are those words uh, then creating a problem for the CPA uh, statute? But isn't the question whether the word purchaser should be there, Andy? If, if you just change the wording to a qualified <laughs> developer, the first is we're doing it one way or the other, but the word purchaser says they are buying it. Yeah, that's my concern, unless it's like you're purchasing the agreement, but I, I would have thought it was purchasing the property. It's a purchase of lease. Yeah, that's the way I read it. I read it as to, it could be a purchaser of the property, but it could also, I read it to be purchaser of a lease. And we can have Sharin take one more look at it. We're going back to her anyway. So, you know, it, the we can bring that question to her and just make sure that you know, I don't think that affects the recommendation because you know, we all know what the intent is. So we can bring that back and just um, um, get it confirmed. Okay, so um, I'm going to go ahead and take this off in a moment so I can get back to a more normal view. But um, we could do a motion today that we recommend uh, this order to the council subject to a final review by uh, KP law and uh, for, for the purpose of making sure that um, we are, should be comfortable with subparagraph C and uh, then we can get Sharon's uh, final say on it. So um, going off of, uh, stopping to share uh, for that in Lynn. Yeah, I'm ready to make your hand. that work. Okay, I, they, you had a question then. I had one more question. And as I, I do apologize if this got asked earlier, um, as we enter in to the contract to purchase, um, have we already done complete surveys of the land so we know the developer any issues and the, the question is um is there any contingency risk you know when you go to buy a house you the final inspection you can get out of the deal um do we have to address that here has that already been addressed so we've we've done whatever due diligence um you know i was struck by john talking about lead paint and some other things that were after the fact um with the houses so is this when we authorize it it's a done deal or when we go into something like this, do we have that final clause on the purchase and sale subject to a whatever? It's, that's my question. We've already, for the, we've already, for all intents and purposes, we've completed our due diligence. If the council on the 25th of January decides not to move forward, then that is the ultimate contingency that we can back out of the, we can back out of the deal. But our main contingencies were wetlands, buildable acreage, um, developability of the site, um, 21E, things of that sort, and making sure that the land appraised for uh, at or above what the town um, was willing to pay for the land. Unlikely to be any surprises like an old oil tank underneath the whatever that was never removed or, you know, you know, it's, I know it's not a toxic waste dump. So I'm just, it's, it's, 
what I did, we didn't do very well when we bought our house, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if Rob wants to say more about that, but. Uh, I'll just say that we, uh, besides our own research of the history of the property, we've had an environmentalist out there to look at the property and walk the site, including the uh, the formal wetland delineation and reporting, which is done. Uh, and and now we're moving into survey. So that would be the next step. So we feel like we've passed that, that stage. That's what I want to know. Thank you. And, and okay, Lynn, back to you then. Yeah, I, I want to add on to that. Have we done an inspection of the houses? And do we know that they are able to be rented as is, or will we have to invest in them? We have not done our own um, home inspections, probably what you might be thinking of on a, a typical purchase. Uh, the properties are managed by a professional uh, property management company and have been certified through our rental registration program. And then through the appraisal process, uh, you know, the condition was highlighted in that reporting as well. That's the extent of the work we've done related to the structures uh, so far. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, there's two other hands do the motion? first, or do you want the motion? Uh, why don't we go ahead with the motion and see if there's any uh, discussion on the motion and we can move forward. Um, I recommend, uh, I, I move that the, that the finance committee recommend the approval by the town council of the appropriation and borrowing authorization and land acquisition and development order F21-08. Um, subject to final review by legal counsel. Second, DeAngelis. It has been a motion and a second. Any further discussion on the motion? Sarah, I see your hand up, but I assume that was from before. Yes, so. sorry. I don't know. Am I supposed to put it down? Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so anybody from the, anyone from the committee have any uh, additional comments? Bob Hegner. Yeah, I just I just want to say to I, I I'm very familiar with this area, the area, um, I drive by it more often than I should. Um, and um, it's, I think it's a very, very good location for affordable housing. Uh, my only concern, and this was raised earlier, is that um, the infrastructure uh, around um, where Route 9 and, and East Street meet is not very safe um, for pedestrians and certainly for bikers. Um, and I think it will and will require some further investment, um, especially, especially if, uh, you know, there's the other development going on on East Street, if this goes through, if the apartments start, um, you know, increasing the number of residents there. Um, I don't think it's a, a showstopper, but I do think we ought to be aware of that, that there, there is going to, we, it's just not safe as it is now, and there's a lot of you know, there's Cumberland Farms, people cut it in and out. There's that little triangle by the bank and people cut across Route 9. I mean, it's it's pretty dangerous place. So uh, I wouldn't want to walk there. I wouldn't want to have young kids there. So just bearing that in mind that we're going to have to address that at some point in the future. But I do support the idea. Anything else? I you know, I would just, in our report, Andy, I think it's important to, that, to note that because it is a, um, developing housing comes with infrastructure and we don't, we don't often finance it in the cost. So I, I think it is the, we're, ta we're taking on it to me, an obligation to do something about it at some point, not in this thing. So it, it, I think it's a, a really important point to emphasize, not to hold this up, but it is, yeah. It, yeah. It, it does have a complication, and Dave alluded to it earlier, and that is that uh, this is a state highway. And uh, so we don't have, even if we weren't going to say to our uh, DPW folks, put it up higher in the list, actually, it's not our road to maintain. 
Um, right. That's a point well taken, Andy. I, I, but I mean, I do think we need then to advocate with the state to, to yeah, improve no. it. Yeah. No, I think that the important uh, the point that you make and that Kathy's suggestion that it be included in the report are well taken. Uh, but I just wanted to point out that there's that additional piece. So having gone through um, that, um, I'm going to first ask uh, Bob and Bernie if they have any uh, comments that they would like to make to the committee. And uh, since they're not voting members, but I always want to make sure that we have their statements. And um, I will also then call for a vote from the voting members of the committee. Um, so Bernie, any? Yeah, real, real quick. Um, I know that Route 9 has been on Guilford's to-do list for quite some time, and he's been going back and forth with the Commonwealth on that. Um, the other thing is, I think our, our ownership, the town's ownership of that property and our plans for housing there, well, could actually bump it up on Mass Dot's waiting list. So those concerns are valid, but I think we're moving, we, we have a, an opportunity to kind of move things forward here. I'm in support of the project. I think that it's, uh, it's a good, like I said, it's a good find, uh, the, this particular property. And I think it's been well thought through. I've got some concerns about tying with uh, with East Street School, but you know, uh, we've we've also got some assets um, working with us and for us. So I think things will work out. And I would I would recommend to the committee that they uh, the, that they support the project. Bob, do you have anything else to say? No, I mean, as I said, I, I support the project wholeheartedly. I just wanted to point out that one issue that is you know something for the future. Okay, so for members of the committee, I'm going to go through and ask for a uh, vote so that we can have it recorded in the minutes that we have voted on the motion that's on the floor made by uh, Councilor Pres Council President Griesmer. Um, Dorothy Pam. Yes, I strongly support the project. Kathy Shane. Yes. Uh, Pat DeAngelis? Yes. And Lynn? Yes. And I vote yes, so that it is unanimous five to zero. And we will indicate that the two resident members have indicated their support for it also. Um, so with that, um, Dave and Rob and Sarah, thank you very much. This And Rita, thank you very much, all four of you. Um, this has been very helpful for us. And I'm um, confident that it is going to be helpful. John, also, I didn't mean to leave you out. Uh, in in um, CRC, CRC will, of course, have to take it up as a separate recommendation uh, because it was referred to two committees. Um, but um, thank all of you for participating today and um, uh, making the presentation to the two committees. So, thank you very thank you, Andy. And we've already got questions. The questions that arose here, we've already got those out to town attorney. So Sean and Sonia and I will work those and and get those back to you and CRC and the and the full council. Okay. Thank you all. Great. Thanks for your thank support. You. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. 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 So um, we want to. Uh, do you want to put the, if you have the agenda easily available, Lynn? I so will find you, it. Uh, so that we can get back to where we were. In the meantime, there was one piece of, um, uh, there's no uh, attendees left, so we're going to have to worry about public comment. There's one thing that I was going to take up under uh, item seven, which is uh, topics not anticipated. Uh, and that is that yesterday at the um, council meeting, uh, the council took up the question that this committee had recommended uh, a policy for FY, uh, for the current year for the inventory. And um, the basic, uh, and this is for the, um, not, uh, mostly for Bob and Bernie who were not there, 
uh, there was some suggestions that some additional information might be needed on the property questions. Um, and there were three things in particular. Um, one was whether uh, there was any zoning that affected the use of the um, any of the properties um, that we might be considering, particularly if they are surplus and going along those lines, whether there are any leases that are um, in, involved in the buildings that will affect that, the, any of the funding that has um, been uh, used for the acquisition or maintenance of the building creates any uh, encumbrances on uh, use, use of the building. And the way that we talked about it, the council meeting was, is that we would consider that at a future finance committee meeting, so that uh, because we had a provision in there, I don't have the exact language in front of me right now, but essentially that we would have a comment box for each um, property so that those kind of additional information, including, and there was one thing listed about, uh, I think it was future use, could be added and so that we felt that these are things that fit within that category. So I just wanted to report that to you. Um, I don't intend to have the discussion today because I don't think we have time and unless Sean tells us that he needs the answer um, immediately, I don't think that it's worth spending time. Sean? Yeah, I mean, I think our position is, you know, unless somebody on the finance committee objects to us, putting that information in there that we're just gonna go ahead and do it. Um, they're, they're sort of one-time things that we would put in for each property. And once it's in there, then we would just keep it from year to year. Um, so we're, we're fine going ahead and just, you know, adding that to our list. Okay, I have a uh, email that I will forward to you that I received from uh, Councilor Brewer this uh, morning. Uh, that she kind of uh, basically restates it, but I will make sure so that we have the exact terms and I will okay. uh, make sure that, okay, that gets done, forwarded to you. So um, the uh, question of the stormwater management bylaw and illicit discharge bylaw, the key staff for that are going to be at the next, um, are, are going to be available at our next scheduled meeting, which I think is January 26th. We don't really have to get into a discussion of this today. I did encourage you to take a look at the presentations that were made. <clears throat> Unfortunately, um, I think the meeting and hear the, the staff uh, that were involved really answered some questions that get into the financial questions that were posed at that meeting. Amherst Media, as of yesterday, had not yet posted that December meeting on its website. And I don't know that, uh, I think we just have to wait, but between now and January 26th, my assumption is it will be up there and that uh, the, those of you who were not at the meeting and want to take um, a look at the uh, discussion and hear those questions and responses from our um, very informed staff in advance, uh, we'll have the opportunity. Lynn? I think that meeting got posted late yesterday afternoon. Okay, because uh, I checked early in the yeah. Early in the afternoon, so if it's if it's up there now, then it's available. Are there any other questions or uh, immediate comments about agenda item three as listed on your screen? Do you know if we have the rewrites of these bylaws yet? Because we were waiting for the rewrites and voted automatic referral once they were received from legal counsel. Um, we can double check with, um, with Guilford, see if that's come back yet. Okay. 
And and once it comes back, I assume Guilford and his staff will proof them to make sure that it's all consistent with what they understand to be the case. Okay. Yeah, I'll ask them about that. I'm going to get up for a second just to put some additional turn on an additional light in this room because it's getting darker. Uh, but uh, does that answer, um, Lynn? Is my understanding that um, it has been referred and that yes. uh, we were just assuming that we would have the rewrite of the bylaws before the 26th and that they would be available to the committee prior to our being able, uh, our having the discussion on that day. And uh, Sean has confirmed that all of the staff that presented at the council meeting, uh, Beth Wilson and Amy Secchi and possibly Guilford um, will be able to attend. And when is our next meeting? It's February. It's so, um, the 26th, I think. After yeah, uh, the meeting, right. It's January 26th. Because I don't think that we needed action before the, yeah, I mean, there's not, it's not moving that quickly when you look at the timetable, but we do need to move on it. Um, and then the um, other thing that's on there, I'm just going to keep going because I think we're actually pretty close to the end of the meeting then, to the resident members of the committee memo that um, was distributed yesterday for the counselors um, about uh, items, it, it actually covers, it's really dealing with uh, the entire council, so all committees, but there's a large section that is labeled as finance. And uh, the request is uh, that each committee schedule um, the, a, a time in which it can review the relevant portions of that to-do list. Um, council um, activities for the next year um, for its committee and then comment back. And um, I, it's not something that we were intending to do in detail today because of the amount of time involved in the fact that it's now getting on towards 4, um, 415. And uh, I don't think we have the bandwidth to take the issue on at this point, but uh, I did want to encourage uh, attention to it for the next meeting. In the meantime, my suggestion was is that uh, Kathy is vice chair and I, and I know I'm going to call on Kathy then after this is after I finish the statement. Uh, but Kathy and I take a look at what is immediately um, on the list and what needs to be addressed um, in, a, uh, in a short time span. Uh, and the second thing that we do is continue to schedule our meetings at two o'clock on the day following council meetings, whenever council meetings occur, which is where that next date comes from and that we uh, just assume that for about it at the next meeting, Kathy. Thanks, Andy. Um, I was just gonna comment on that, but not in specific. I think there were items on that and then trying to look at what some scheduling and uh, we had had a separate quick discussion and it's come up in the past, Mary Lou had raised it. Um, 
uh, on things that we might want to, as the finance committee, with our ability to ask for analysis or comparisons of, of budgets, I mean, advanced budget, do we want to raise the issue of how much Amherst spends on schools compared to other schools in um, Western Mass as we're hearing about the uh, what a flat budget would do for them. So when we look at the agenda items, I just wanna figure out whether that's something we would wanna talk about at the committee level, we, whether we wanna have a separate conversation. So I just want to raise that as, as an issue that I'd like to figure out some way to have on an agenda. So on this future agenda items, uh, holding slot here. So I'm not saying tomorrow or um, a date, but I'm not sure it was on the larger list, Lynn. Um, so if it is not on the larger list, I would assume that it would emanate from this committee. Right. Uh, and, uh, and then at some point we need to discuss the feasibility of being able to have that done for this year versus for next year. Exactly. So I wasn't thinking like this year, but how do we get it in a pipeline? What would be the nature of it? Because I think it's a third, it's an outside third party kind of look for us. So we're, we're not um, just bombarding the, the schools with questions. It's more a, a comparative analysis. Yeah. Let, let me also just explain this, this process, this memo, messy as it is, is the first step to getting to setting up a future agendas list and counting for the entire council. That is not a small job. And I also want Sonia and Sean to look at it from their perspective because I may have missed uh, certain key dates. Like for instance, I'm thinking now, did I put approval of CPA projects on there? Okay. so. Uh, there are certain things on this list that we have to do. There's other things on this list that seem to be higher priority, but there's going to come a point where we're also going to come back and say, which of these are truly our priorities and which we just can't get it all done. It's too, it's too ambitious a list to get done in one year. And I don't want us to rush to do things and not do them well. So, um, but I, I really appreciate all of the, in, the input from people, um, both counselors and staff looking at this who really know what they bring to the council. Yeah, I had uh, made that suggestion, but unfortunately I, th I didn't follow Lynn's instructions very well and uh, sent a separate memo as opposed to um, trying to do it on the document itself. And I think that's why it uh, didn't Your comments there. are there, but, Andy. <laughs> Your comments are on the document. No, oh, I'm not worried. <laughs> Dorothy. So I want to check about our committee meeting. Um, Will, uh, will we be meeting at the same time as CRC? Because I don't want to do that. I want to be able to attend, quietly attend a CRC meeting if I need to. Are they the week after or are they alternate weeks from the town meeting? Do we know? Um, what I had been told was is that their general proposal was to do it the alternating weeks and that we had talked about that as uh, when we made the decision to stay with the day after, mm -hmm. just because it was then taken. So with that, um, is there anything else that somebody wants to raise? And again, there's nobody in the audience at this point as attendees. So I'm not asking, I don't have to ask for public comment, even though it's on the agenda. Um, Just a quick point, Andy. If there's Just nothing else, then I'm gonna go ahead. And... Yeah. Just a quick uh, piece of information. I didn't get to say yes, this. Yes, go ahead, Lynn. Uh, but 
I, you know, as each year, as we elect officers, we also then give counselors the opportunity to affirm and or to say whether they would like to be on other committees. And I'll be sending that email out soon. That is not a suggestion that anybody should leave this committee. It is just to let you know that that does happen annually after the election of office. Then after that, uh, we have our, our election of officers within the committee. Right. The committee vote. Uh, so that's the process going forward. So with that, I think that uh, there's nothing else that we have today. Um, I know it's a long meeting on a, on uh, Ultra Town Road, but uh, it really was. Uh, I felt a helpful presentation, uh, a good discussion. So we got to the end and made a recommendation, which we can now forward back to the council. Hopefully, uh, get the answer from. KP law and the one question that we have asked. If there's nothing else from the committee, I'm sort of looking to see if anybody's raising hands and I don't see anything. So um, I'm going to uh, just declare that the meeting of the Finance Committee is adjourned at 4.22 p.m. Hi, everyone. And Happy New Year. Thank you very much. Bye.